Uh, yeah, I want to talk for a few minutes about Judge Scalia and then the vacancy on the court. There's no question that uh, the Supreme Court has lost a strong and thoughtful voice. There's also no question that no matter where people on the court might have disagreed on issues and it disagreed on the way to interpret the Constitution, uh, that Judge Scalia had a unique capacity to get beyond that uh, and will be missed by the court both for his intellect and for his friendship. He was an associate judge on the court for almost 30 years. Uh, he was a true constitutional scholar, both in his work before the court and on the court, and really brought to the court a, a lifetime of understanding the law. He began his legal career uh, in 1961, practicing uh, in private practice. He, uh, 1967, became part of the faculty of the University of Virginia School of Law. In 1972, he joined the Nixon administration as general counsel for the Office of Telecommunications Policy. And from that place, he was appointed a, an assistant uh, attorney general for the Office of Legal Counsel. He brought great capacity uh, to his work and finished that part of his career off being a law professor again at the University of Chicago. And at, that's, that's the point where he became a judge in 1982 when President Reagan appointed him to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, a case, a, a court that gets many of the cases that wind up on the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, with a little more than four years on that court in 1986, President Reagan nominated him to serve as an associate justice. He was an unwavering defender of the Constitution and brought to the debate at the court as perhaps no one had in a long time, and perhaps no one will in a long time, a sense of what the Constitution was all about and a sense of what the Constitution meant. And by that, he meant what the Constitution meant to the people that wrote it. There's a way to change the Constitution. If the country and the Congress think the Constitution is outmoded in the way it would have been looked at by the people who wrote it, uh, there's a process to do something about that. That process was immediately used when the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution and could still be used if people think the Constitution no longer means what the people who wrote it and the people that voted on it to approve it thought it means. And Justice Scalia brought that to every argument, sometimes arguing against where his personal view might have been but arguing for what the Constitution meant and what it was intended to mean. His opinions were well-reasoned, they were logical, they were eloquent, they were often uh, laced with both humor and maybe a little sarcasm, uh, but they were grounded in the idea that judges should interpret the Constitution the way it was written. Uh, his contributions to the study of law left a profound mark on the legal profession. Lawyers particularly young, young lawyers in many cases, talk about the law differently than they did before uh, Judge Scalia began to argue his view of what the Constitution meant and what the court meant. He was a great legal mind. He was fun to be with. Uh, I personally will miss the opportunities he and I had to talk about books we were reading or books maybe the other one should read or maybe books the other one should just avoid reading because of the time required. But he, was, he had a broad sense of wanting to challenge his own views and being willing to challenge other people's views and do that uh, in a positive way, but a way that um, he thought advanced the, advanced the Constitution and what the Constitution meant to the uh, country. Um, you know, as we, as I stand here today, I'm sure many people all over America and people that the Scalia's came into contact with are continuing to remember his uh, family, uh, our thoughts and prayers with his wife Maureen, their nine children, their literally dozens of grandchildren. I'm not sure if the number's 36 or 39, but it's big enough that it's an impressive number. Uh, and uh, people who had a chance to, to see, to be there, or to read uh, his son's eloquent handling of the funeral service and the eulogy, what a, what a great um, 
What a great legacy. That clearly shows that he and Maureen Scalia are leaving to the country. Now, I I'm not a lawyer, which is often the most popular thing I say, so I don't want to pretend to be a lawyer here talking about the law and the Constitution, but you really don't need to be a brilliant lawyer uh, to understand the Constitution or understand what Judge Scalia was going to be. You know, as a history teacher, as somebody who had a chance to, as you did, Mr. President, be a university president, first person in my family to graduate from college, but I, I had those under, unbelievable opportunities because, because of where we live. But you yeah, the Constitution, there's no, there is no um, magic in the number of how many judges are sitting on the court at any given time. In fact, the Constitution doesn't even suggest what the number should be, and it has been different numbers over time. Um, the number for some years has been nine, but there have often not been nine judges setting. And even when nine judges are setting because of recusal, because of uh, um, the, the other reasons, when judges leave, when judges retire, when judges resign to do something else, there have often not been nine judges. Frankly, there have often been eight judges. There's often been a court that easily could wind up in a 4-4 in a uh, tie. Uh, and in fact, I think 15 times since World War II, uh, the court has only had eight judges. Uh, right after World War II, Harry Truman, who used the desk here before me, right, the desk I get to use when he was a member of the Senate, uh, a month after he became president, he asked uh, Judge Robert Jackson to be the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. And so, Justice Jackson went to Nuremberg and for the better part of a year and a half, from May of 45 until October of 46, uh, he wasn't setting with the court, wasn't making decisions involving the court. He was the chief prosecutor uh, at the Nuremberg trials. Uh, a tied court can do a lot of things. It can uphold a lower court decision. A tied court can decide we're tied and what we really should do is to rehear this case also not unusual in the history of the country because you could, again, you can be tied even if there are nine judges and one of them, for whatever reason, decides they can't participate in that case. Uh, and when that happens, the court can do a number of things and will. This is an important decision. Uh, and it's a decision in the, uh, the shadow of the next election where nine months and a few days away from people getting a chance to vote, and a lifetime appointment on the court is an important thing. Judge Scalia, three decades, appointed by Ronald Reagan, served for a quarter of a century after Ronald Reagan left the White House, served for a decade after President Reagan died. This is something worth thinking about, and frankly, at this moment in history and in other moments in history when a vacancy has occurred in election year, it, it, is, it has often been the case uh, that the decision is the American people ought to have a say who sits in that Supreme Court seat. That's what will happen this time. I think it's the best thing to happen this time. There's a lot at stake. It was a 5-4 court on decision after decision, and what the court does on the Second Amendment matters, what the court does on the First Amendment matters. You know, the first freedom added to the Constitution, the first freedom in the First Amendment is freedom of religion. Uh, no other country was ever founded on the principle that the, the right to pursue uh, your conscience, the right to pursue your faith is a principal tenet of founding this government. It was a principal tenet in the revolution. More importantly, it, had to be, it was immediately added to the Constitution when there was some concern that maybe the Constitution isn't clear enough about this fundamental principle. You know, at a time when the Obama administration is suing the Little Sisters of the Poor because the Little Sisters of the Poor don't want their health care plan uh, to be a plan that includes things that are different than their faith beliefs, freedom of religion is really important. 
And freedom, or, that's one of the cases before the court right now. I don't know how the court will decide to determine it, but I do know that there is a reason we should be concerned about freedom of religion, the right of conscience. You know, President Jefferson in, in writing a church that had asked him about individual freedom said in a letter to that church while he was president, I think it was a, it was a 18, uh, it might have been, it was late in his administration, might have been an 18 and eight letter said, the right, of all the rights we have, the right of conscience is the one we should hold most dear. And the American people need to be thinking about as they determine the next president who is likely not to just fill this vacancy, but likely to fill more than one vacancy during their time in office. Uh, Mrs. Clinton says if she's elected president that uh, she won't appoint anybody to the Supreme Court that won't reverse the freedom of speech case in Citizens United. Sounds like to me the presidential candidates are willing to make the court a major issue in this campaign. Voters should have the right to make the court a major issue in this campaign as well. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the Second Amendment, the Tenth Amendment that says anything that the Constitution doesn't say the federal government is supposed to do is left to the states. And Mr. President, it, the closer you are to where a problem is to solving that problem, the more likely you're gonna get a common sense dis, uh, solution. That's why that 10th Amendment is there and why it needs to be vigorously adhered to. These are important times. Uh, anytime we have an election in the country, there's always a sense that this may be the most important election we've ever had, and they all are. They all are. And particularly an election where the constitutional principles of government where executive overreach, where regulators who are unaccountable and out of control are one of the big concerns in America today um, is an important time to be thinking about the Supreme Court, an important time to be thinking about our responsibility of citizens and the responsibility of the next president of the United States. This president has every constitutional right and obligation to nominate somebody to a vacancy on the Supreme Court. But there's a second obligation in the Constitution, and that's the obligation of the Senate to confirm that nomination. The Senate has a, I have a view that the answer to that question is, uh, not this person, not right now, because we're too close to making a big decision about the future of the country not to include this process of what happens to the Supreme Court. Uh, in that process. I wish the process of democracy well, the American people well as they think about these things, and the Senate well as we do the other work that the Constitution requires us to do. And I yield the floor.